if you've heard sermons or teaching on Revelation, you've likely heard somebody explain the seven churches or at least a sermon or two out of the seven churches, maybe the church at Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Uh, but what I want us to consider today is how do we interpret, how do we rightly read the letters to the seven churches? It's probably the easiest part of Revelation. How do we need to see that? So it's seven real churches uh, that, that John is writing to, letters from Jesus to them. Seven real churches in the first century. It's likely laid out geographically with starting with the port city of Ephesus and then working your way through what is now modern day Turkey. There's seven as well because the number seven is symbolic throughout Revelation. It represents the number of completeness. So as a result, the seven churches represent the church, all believers for all time and all places. So it applies to local churches. And then there's individual language in each of the letters that it applies to us individually as believers. Revelation 2, 7 he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, repeated for each church. So what else do we see when we look closely? And this is crucial. Each letter is from Christ. The descriptions of Jesus in Revelation 1, 12 through 20, which I encourage you to reread that before you start reading the seven churches probably every time the descriptions are then grabbed hold of and then are significant in what he says to the church so example the very first the letter to ephesus verse one to the angel of the church at ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now that was said in the description of Christ. And what this is saying is that Christ knows the church and he's going to say things to them because he knows them that are likely not obvious to them. He knows because he is among them. So you need to read the descriptor in each letter and ask this question. What does what Christ says about himself have to do with what he is about to say or what he says to this particular church. Don't skip over that. Don't just read it and just say, oh, it said that earlier. It means something. Also, we need to see that there's a pattern in how these letters unfold, the letters to the seven churches. There's seven of them, and they're in two groups of three, and then the one in the middle... Thyatira is the longest. It's kind of the hinge between these two groups of three. The first group of three, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum, the summons to hear precedes the promise. I'll say more about that in a moment. In the, in the middle letter, and then in the second group of three, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, the order of these two elements is then reversed. So the promise precedes the summons to hear. And within each group of these three, the, the central letter in the middle, so the first group of three, Smyrna is in the middle. The second group of three is Philadelphia is in the middle. There's a commendation and no rebuke to these churches. He has nothing negative to say. There's no call of repentance. And the reference to opposition to those who falsely claim to be Jews is referred to, and there is a promise for a crown for both of these churches. The opening and the closing of the letters in the second group, Sardis and Laodicea, the dominant tone in those two final letters is one of absolute rebuke. Now, why do I, as an individual Christian, and I as a pastor, why, why as a, a pastor who leads a local church, why do I need to be concerned, and why does our local church need to be concerned with how we read and how we study these letters? I'll give you two absolute clear reasons. Each letter has a summons. 
Revelation 3, 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not just that church, to the churches. We need to hear what is the Lord saying to our church? What is he saying to me as an individual? Now, lest we get overly concerned and and get out of bounds in our minds over the concerns of the rebukes, we need to hear that the rebukes are there for a purpose to call us to repentance and restoration so that we hear the promise that is in every letter. The promise is to the one who conquers or to the one who overcomes. Now, this theme, the theme of conquering and overcoming, runs throughout the rest of Revelation. It's not just here in the seven letters. It's all throughout the book. So, Revelation 13, 10. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Revelation 14, 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Here's the promise. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to eat to the tree, right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. All who overcome in Christ will share that blessing. Overcoming in Christ is first having your robes washed, being cleansed by the blood of Christ, and obeying Christ in your life and walking with Him. We're going to see this in the very first letter of what that means of not leaving your first love and how that proceeds into our lives. Brothers and sisters, here's what's going to happen as you read these letters. Here's what's going to happen as we teach these letters in our church. God's going to speak very directly to us. You're going to speak very directly to me as, as, as a pastor. He's going to speak very directly to me as a Christian. He's going to speak very directly to you as you read and as we hear. And he's going to speak to us as a church or to your local church. We need to hear and heed what he says. And our heart and desire is that we conquer, that we overcome, and that we one day eat of the tree of life. May you be blessed as you read it.